Heading into the year 1981, Irishman Ralph Furman Sr. is looking forward to another successful year with his Van Diemen company that is at the forefront of one of the most important Formula 1 feeder series categories of them all, the British Formula Ford Championship. It was one of the first stepping stones for drivers aiming for Formula 1, and impressing here was pretty much a requirement if you had the want to go any further. Some of them were Sunday drivers looking for a thrill, some though were aiming for glory. For Furman, he was more searching for some of the latter. Since entering the scene in 1979, the team had won five Formula Ford titles and four Formula Ford festivals. They were the team of the time and it was the car to have. With the seat going for £20,000 per year, it would have attracted a few names, or at least the ones who could afford such a journey. But after conversing with Formula 1 driver Chico Serra, Furman would end up taking on board a young Brazilian who was looking to make his car racing debut. Fresh off the karting scene, where he had won everything bar the World Karting Championship, this young man would take the racing world by storm and assert himself as a a legend of the sport, with the signs being there right from the moment he stepped into a racing car. This driver, of course, was the one and only Ayrton Senna. Well, if we're going to be pedantic, back then, his name was Ayrton Senna da Silva. A native of Sao Paulo, Ayrton was already well established as someone to keep an eye on in the motor racing ranks, looking to make his car racing debut in 1981 after tearing up the karting scene for quite a few years prior beforehand. With multiple championships in his homeland and throughout South America, he went over to Europe to try and win the World Karting Championship, but he could never quite win it, twice finishing runner-up in 1979 and 1980, and was always hustled by the karting legend known as Terry Fullerton, whom Ayrton regarded as his greatest racing rival, pure driving, pure racing. None of which really describes motor racing nowadays, but it is the world we live in. And hey, I hate to interrupt this video, but I want to take a moment to talk about my favorite VPN brand. I know y'all want to get back to iAirton, so I'll make this snappy. Surfshark is a VPN service that encrypts all the data that you send through the internet, protecting said data and keeping any manuses from getting at it. I've said that sentence so many times, but we've got newbies here, so bear with me for a moment, okay? Surfshark ain't a one-trick pony like Gunter Steiner, though. Like, we all love streaming, right? We also hate it whenever streaming services are restricted based on our location right? Well, with Surfshark, you can change your location by passing said restrictions, thereby allowing you access to your favorite content. It could therefore be a vital tool for those people who live in countries where, for some reason, they feel the need to censor their people. It ain't quite teleportation, but it is about as close as we're going to get right now. So by using my link in the description and using the promo code Josh Ravel for this month, you can get Surfshark VPN for 85% off and three extra months for free. Wow. That amounts to around about a couple of bucks a month for protection. And remember, this alien and human form is trying to self-verification for eight bucks a month. Comparatively speaking, it's the bargain of the century. Plus there's three free months on there and a 30 day money back guarantee as well. So what the bloody hell are you waiting for? Thanks again to Surfshack for the support and thank you all for still being here. I guess we're going to get back to this Senna business, shall we? Karting, however, can only take you so far. The step up to cars beckoned, but his family also tried to persuade him to give up this racing nonsense and to get on with his real future. After three months at Sao Paulo University and apparently a pep talk from your Brenner, he decided, nah. This ain't for me. And so, Ayrton arrived in the UK in November 1980 and moved to Eton in the burbs of Norwich, trying to adjust to the delightful climate that has made that region oh so desirable. Not speaking a word of English, only eating eggs, and trying to pick up whatever phrases he could, watching British television. So, in essence, the greatest driver of a generation based his vocabulary on John Cleese. He had the meeting with Furman, secured a drive thanks to a sloppy test and 10,000 British sterling, and so, fresh out of carts, Ayrton Senna de Silva was a works driver. Although his mechanics, apparently finding it difficult to pronounce his name, preferred instead to call him Harry. Brilliant. This being his first season in cars, the aim really would be to stick with his teammates pace-wise and sort of see how the rest of the season turns out. In his first race, he would finish behind both his teammates in P5. It's alright, but not trailblazingly good. There was no hint here of what was to come. Although that said, this fifth place finishing would be the worst result for him that year. At the next round in Thruxton, he would take his first podium and would win his first race at the following round at Brands Hatch. Three consecutive second place finishes were good, healthy results that helped us championship cause. But this was Ayrton, sorry, Harry, the fiery young Brazilian. There were 14 races on his schedule by mid-May. He won 11 of them. 
adding to the one he secured earlier, bringing his year total to 12 victories. With three pole positions and podiums in all but two races that year, he won the Townsend Thorson and RAC Formula 4 titles, the two principal Formula 4 titles in Great Britain. He had displayed some incredible wet weather driving and secured himself a personal photographer in Keith Sutton. It was a dream first year for him in racing cars, and when asked about his future plans on the podium at the final round that year, he replied, I have to go now. My planet needs me. This was a complete shock. A driver that seemed destined for greatness, quitting so early in his career too. But apart from attempting to save his marriage, his premature retirement was primarily down to the one thing that plagues every driver in the world. Money. See, despite coming from a wealthy family, they never really invested heavily in Ayrton's career. He needed a sponsor. But with drivers such as Nelson Piquet in Formula 1 dominating the headlines back home, nobody was paying attention to this young dude in Formula Ford. I mean, why would they? He didn't get the publicity that he needed, and thus couldn't seem to find the elusive sponsor. And a recession in the Brazilian economy didn't help matters either. He returned to Brazil and to his family. He stayed away from the racing scene when the year 1982 had arrived. But by February, he knew that he couldn't accept this. He wanted to race. He needed to race. He told his father this and decided, Ah, uh, f**k, it'll give you the money to race. And so Ayrton returned to the UK, signing up with Russian Green Racing, and enlisted into the British and European Formula Ford 2000 Championships. Faster cars with slick tyres and wings. These cars were a bit of a step up from what he had before, thus why it cost 40 grand for a season. But Ayrton wanted only to pay 10,000 for a year. For you see, a few months prior, Dennis Rushin, the team owner, was so enamoured by Ayrton that he remarked, You know, if you come back next year, you can have the seat for 10,000 pounds. It was a light-hearted half-joke, but Ayrton took it as matter-of-fact. Here they were today, and he did not forget. In the end, they agreed to a £30,000 price tag, Ayrton got his pops to wire the money, told his wife the marriage was over, and announced his triumphant return to motor racing in a retirement so short that it made Tom Brady blush. For Mr. Senator Silver, the equation heading into 1982 was simple. Pole position, fastest lap, and the race win. In every single race. Anything less was a failure, and that season, he could regard it as a failure, but Ayrton would win 16 out of 19 races in the British Championship, and 6 out of 9 in the European one. Apart from a few hiccups throughout that season, thanks to overzealousness or the machinery going all macachrome on him, he ended up winning more than 78% of the races he competed in that year. That was a manic total, and was rewarded with both the British and European Championships. In two years, he had won three championships, well, four, if we're going to be pedantic. One of the races he won was particularly memorable, at one of the rounds in Snedderton, while Whilst romping away to an easy win, he began to slow dramatically for some reason. He lost the lead and fell back to 7th place, and the team were going, whoa, what's going on with them? What they didn't know was that at some point on that first lap, a piece of debris severed the front brake line. So basically, he didn't have any front brakes, he only had the rear ones to work with, which in racing terminology means he had no brakes. His teammate now had a 15 second lead over the field, and he was now on course for victory. Until Ayrton conceived a brilliant idea of adjusting the front anti-roll bar to its softer setting and driving his car like a go-kart. He began to pick up speed, clawed through the pack, passed his teammate, and won the race. When his teammate after the race asked him how he himself could improve, Ayrton replied, Break later. I was breaking later than you and I had no brakes. <laughs> Housery. And by now, Formula 1 teams were taking notice of him. One of those teams was McLaren, spearheaded by the legendary Ron Dennis. He saw Senna for what he was, an intellect with bucket loads of talent. He offered Ayrton a deal for a testing role and potential future race seat at McLaren, but he refused because he wanted a guarantee for his future in the sport. And at that time, he didn't trust the contract. He alone wanted to control his own destiny. And next year would be the last of his junior career before reaching Formula 1, he reasoned. He wanted wanted to show everyone why he was the new sheriff in town. The logical step up was Formula 3, more specifically, British Formula 3. At that time, the most competitive junior racing series in the world. As to what team he would go with, there were a couple of options. The first was Eddie Jordan's team, which, in a roundabout way, is what eventually morphed into the Aston Martin Formula 1 team. Jordan was known as a bit of a village idiot within the paddock, but he did know what he was doing a lot of the time, and knowing what Ayrton could do, he gave him a test in his F3 car for free. Within 20 laps, he had taken the car around Silverstone Club Circuit as fast as anyone had ever gone around there, and then proceeded to tell them how they can go even faster. 
And then he went home. It was a good team for sure. And history would prove that. But Ayrton wanted the best. And at that time, the best team was West Surrey Racing, run by Dick Bennett. After dominating a non-championship race at Thruxton, Ayrton knew it was the team to be at. So he ghosted Eddie Jordan's calls, buggered off to Brazil, got the £110,000 needed to race that season, and signed with West Surrey Racing for 1983. Actually, with Senna's personal sponsors and family backing, he was only able to cough up £70,000. But Valvoline were keen to be on the championship car and thus covered the difference to help Ayrton secure the seat. The family also hired a manager for him and for the new season, he would drop the silver from his name in order to give him a more distinguishable name for those watching back home. Henceforth shall be called simply Ayrton Senna or Ayrton in the years to come. His love for the British weather was exemplified by his refusal to fly back until the very last minute, arriving in the UK a couple of weeks before the season started, which obviously limited his testing. But it didn't matter, he was immediately on the pace, because of course he was. The first round at Silverstone, everyone there had felt that Senna was the favourite for the title. Sure, the likes of Davy Jones and Calvin Fish could potentially hold a candle, but then again, the best team, the best car, arguably Nate, perhaps certainly the best driver too. Naturally then, at the end of qualifying, the pole position for that race went to David Leslie. Senna was furious. He maintained that Leslie and his crew of miscreants at Robertson Motorsport were cheating. He had no proof of this, but hey, as we know nowadays, who needs proof when fibbing makes you seem intelligent? In the end though, it didn't matter. Senna ran away to victory with the fastest lap. In the next race at Thruxton, he would take pole position and would cruise home to take victory. And he would do that again at round three at Silverstone. And then again at the next round. And then again at the next round. And then the one after that. And the round after that. And the round after that. And the round after that. This almighty domination was scarcely believable. But at the same time, it kind of wasn't unbelievable. He had all the aces in his hand. It was an unbeatable combo. At this point, Senna didn't really need to win any more races that year. At least, not really. That was never his mindset. But the lead was such that it was almost unassailable. Almost but not entirely, and come the 10th round of the championship at Silverstone, it all started to go wrong. The 12th of June brought about round 10 of the British Formula 3 Championship, and the 7th round of the European Championship, but all racing was merged for this weekend. There wasn't any split on this, so what this basically meant was that competitors had a choice. You want points for the British Championship or the European Championship? Naturally, the British runners would want points, but the European runners would have the faster Yokohama tyres, and when presented with these options, the young egocentric men of the paddock decided, haha, fast tyres go vroom vroom. Almost all of them went for the faster rubber, and decided to hell with the points. This included Ayrton. But despite what you may be thinking, it wasn't him who took the spoils. It was instead his closest competitor that year. The man behind the wheel of Eddie Jordan's car. The very car that Ayrton had tested just the year prior. The man from Norfolk. The captain of commentary. The king of gridwalks. The one and only Martin Brundle. We think of Brundle nowadays as the sort of voice of Formula 1. Sorry, Crofty. But back in his competitive days, Brundle could hang with the best of them. And this year was do or die for him and beating Ayrton for the first time this year to the pole before running away to victory while Ayrton crashed at Woodcote was a pivotal moment. At that point, Brundle knew that he had what it took to beat Senna. And Senna knew that Brundle knew that he could beat him. And Brundle knew that Senna knew that Brundle knew that he could beat him. Game on. Cadwell Park. This slightly oversized go-kart track is a pleasure to drive, just so long as you don't make a mistake. Because if you do make a mistake, you kind of die. Senna took pole position, but he decided that the time wasn't good enough. He went back out and stunned the paddock by crashing into a marshal's post and writing off his car. The long and short of it, Senna would not start that race and scored no points at all, while Brundle won the race by miles, making it two wins in a row. And in the next race at Snedderton, the two would butt heads at the end of the back straight. Senna retired again, and Brundle won again. Depending upon who you talk to, Ayrton did get stitched up here, and in his mind, this was the point when British Motorsport made it clear to him that they had their boy, and it wasn't him. In the next two rounds, Senna and Brundle would trade wins, but Dick Bennett was starting to sweat a little bit, as the points lead that Ayrton had developed in the first half of the year began to bleed away. One of the focal points of the season, however, was yet to come. Ayrton was known for his, shall we say, 
aggressive style of driving, putting his car in a position where he would either take said position or both drivers would crash. And seeing as how most drivers would prefer some points rather than nothing at all, more often than not, they would cede position. But Martin decided not to do that anymore. And at Alton Park, Ayrton went for a move that was never on and Martin would not yield. Senna's attempt at reverse parallel parking hardly amused the race stewards, nor Brundle for that matter, who was stuck underneath his rolls. Senna would win the next race at Silverstone, but then Brundle would go on a tear, winning three races in a row. All the while, there were suspicions regarding Brundle's car, in that it was running too low to the ground. Was this a founded accusation, and was it legal? Well, depends upon who you talk to. But pushing the limits of the rules, getting up to tricks, that's racing. Some may not like it, but that's the nature of the game. And the best ones at it are the ones that don't get caught. Senna and Bennett thought they had caught them, but the officials thought not. The story being that Eddie Jordan claimed the car was too low because someone was blinded by Senna spraying champagne, causing that person to fall onto the car, breaking the car, and thus making it as low as it was. Now, unless the person that fell into your car was Pearl, that argument holds less weight than what your car apparently did. But this is Eddie Jordan we're talking about here. He can sell salt to a slug. Brundle kept his points heading into the final round at Thruxton. Interesting thing regarding Brundle, he was leading the championship by a point over Ayrton heading into that race. But seeing as how the point system back then meant you had to drop your best three results that year, the only way he could have won that championship was by starting on pole position, securing the fastest lap, and winning the race. But Brundle didn't do any of those things. Ayrton completely dominated the race and became the 1983 British Formula 3 champion. Of course, that wasn't the final race for him that year. That would come in Macau, the most prestigious, most anticipated junior formula race in the calendar year before they butchered it. Preceding that, however, he had been testing with the Brabham Formula 1 team amid speculation that he may end up landing a role there. After the test was done, he landed at Macau at midnight on the Wednesday preceding the race and didn't even bother to walk the track beforehand. He was jet-lagged to the gills. He was drowned in alcohol by Tommy Byrne and actually missed the debrief on the night before the race. But as it turned out, all of that didn't matter an ounce. Pole position, qualifying race win, and overall Grand Prix win. In three years, Senna had won everything he could possibly we win in terms of championships. British Formula Ford 1600 champion, British Formula Ford 2000 champion, British Formula 3 champion, and Macau Grand Prix winner. Heading toward 1984, Senna had tested for the Williams, McLaren, and Brabham Formula 1 teams. In that Williams test, it only took him about 20 laps before he had gone over one and a half seconds faster than that year's Formula 2 champion, Jonathan Palmer, and terrified mechanics at the Donington track, who was certain he was going beyond the car's capabilities. At the McLaren test, he left many people aghast when he blew his engine still set the fastest time and drove back to the pits with substantially less engine in the car than what it started out as. McLaren were not that happy with Ayrton's on-the-go engine dismantlement. At Brabham, there were politics at play, Nelson Piquet apparently being as thin-skinned as he is today, not wanting another young Brazilian coming in, adorning one of the other team's seats, and potentially taking away his darling appeal to the Brazilian audience. Lotus wanted him in their car for that year, but their sponsor demanded that a British driver fill one of those seats, and thus they retained the Brabham. Mammoth. McLaren and Brabham had presented contracts for testing roles in 1984 with potential race roles in later years. But again, control your own destiny. That's why, after testing with Tolman toward the end of 1983, and having gone faster than the regular driver Derek Warwick had ever done around there, he signed a two-year deal to race for the Tolman Formula 1 team from 1984 onwards. And the rest, as is so often said, as is so often said, was history. Ayrton! 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 